Good evening and welcome. Welcome to, I'm sure it will be a really interesting uh, talk tonight, The Lost Rainforests of Britain. So the main speaker, Guy Shropsall, I'll be handing over to in a moment. I just wanted to abuse my position as a chairman just to introduce myself. My name's McNabb Laurie, working on the Galloway Lens Project, obviously here in South West Scotland. Five years of National Lottery Heritage funded activity in the Kendi Valley, uh, running from Carspan right the way down through Castle Douglas and Kukubri, home to what I hope are a frag quite a few fragments of, uh, of what could be designated rainforests. Um, so the plan tonight is uh, we're gonna he hear from Guy, hear about the journey that he's been on, he's been the, the introduction of this word rainforest and why we should be engaging more with this topic. Uh, so this event is actually part of the Fantastic Forest Festival, and if you've managed to make it through the month without hearing about the Fantastic Forest Festival, then where have you been? Because it is a series of 12 events, a variety of online, in-person walks, talks, guided, uh, guided walks, um, taking place in Galloway. And what we're trying to do here is take a slightly different look at our woodlands, because there's a lot of consultation activity, there's a lot of community engagement about trees, and I think what we're trying to do is to reawaken people's excitement with trees. And the event tonight, uh, hearing from Guy, will do exactly that. So I've got a couple of things to tidy up at the end, um, uh, I'll, uh, and then we'll do some questions uh, after Guy's spoken. There is a consultation starting next week, which just wanted to flag up particularly of interest with tonight's event. The new forestry grant scheme consultations talking about being launched. I think it's the 22nd it's due to be launched and you'll see that coming out on the Scottish Government website. So um, just a quick mention of that because really what, why are we doing these events? Why are we doing the Fantastic Forest Festival? It's all about getting people more engaged with forestry and feeling, feeling able to speak what they want out of their woodlands, particularly here in Galloway but also further afield. So I've talked for a fascinating three or four minutes there, but I think really none of you came to hear me. I'd like to hand over, if you're happy, to Guy, and you're happy to start sharing your screen. Brilliant. And then we'll ask Guy to give us a bit of an overview of the journey that he's been on. Um, pop any questions in the Q&A box, and I'll take great pleasure in putting them to Guy uh, when he's finished talking. But if you're happy, Guy, the metaphorical floor is yours. Uh, thanks very much, McNabb, and thank you to, to yourself and to Morag for inviting me to speak this evening, and thanks everyone for coming. Um, so, um, yes, this is the front cover to my book, The Lost Rainforest of Britain, not uh, a photograph of a rainforest, but a, a beautiful watercolour uh, illustration that was done uh, by Alan Lee, and Alan Lee you might have heard of as uh, more famously is the um, illustrator of uh, the works of, of Tolkien um, and um, I he was my childhood hero when I poured over his illustrated uh, books not just about uh, not just the works of the you know, Lord of the Rings and the works of Tolkien but also books on sort of fairies and gnomes and all sorts of wonderful mythical beasts and um, when I moved to Devon um, uh, two, two, two to three years ago now I just, I realized that um, Alan Lee actually lived uh, not very far from where I'd moved to and um, ended up in the process of writing this book, going and meeting him and interviewing him. Um, because when I looked at some of the illustrations that he'd done of, you know, Mirkwood, Fangorn Forest, of these sort of amazing um, gnarled old woods uh, that are described by Tolkien in, you know, in The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, I started to think, gosh, these look very, very reminiscent of woods that I'm seeing around Dartmoor, and indeed of temperate rainforests. And lo and behold, these were the, these were the, exactly the same places that um, Alan had been drawn to. Um, he moved to De Devon in the 70s and been inspired for many of the illustrations that he went on to produce. In fact, um, if you've ever seen the movies of The Lord of the Rings, um, the Ents, uh, the you know the tree, uh, tree, tree beard, and the other Ents who feature in the second movie, particularly in the second, you know, the, the Two Towers. Uh, the bark is actually the bark of Devon trees that have been uh, that's been sort of scanned in and, and manipulated as part of the CGI process. So there's literally temperate rainforests in the Lord of the Rings films, which I thought is rather, rather wonderful. So let me move from fantasy to reality um, and show you a real temperate rainforest. Uh, again, not not so far from where I uh, live uh, in Devon. This is Black Tor Copse. Um, high up on the high moor of Dartmoor. It's one of three small Atlantic oak woods that still cling on um, in the otherwise very treeless expanse of Dartmoor. And I just wanted to start by showing you this because I think it illustrates a few of the characteristics of temperate rainforest. In Britain, you know, you've got these, uh, this 
just overwhelming sense of green um, covering every surface, the boulders that the trees are growing in. Um, these are all wonderful oaks here. Um, the gnarled and stunted nature that you often get of uh, trees in our temperate rainforest areas, sometimes because of the terrain they're growing in um, and the, the sort of the soils, but also because they can often grow in, in very exposed places, coastal areas where they're you know, kind of blown by the wind, exposed to the elements. Um, the wind shapes their upper canopies like a kind of topiarist uh, and, uh, or a hairdresser, a demonic hairdresser, I like to think, that's giving them this amazing shape. Um, but what really, really characterizes temperate rainforests is the fact that plants are growing here on other plants, loads and loads of epiphytes, as they're called, uh, the mosses and lichens and ferns that you can see clinging to every branch here of this um, wonderful twisted old oak tree in, in Blacktor Copse. But I think, I guess before we go too much further, I do want to just sort of underline the fact that we do actually have rainforests here in Britain. It's not just a term that I've sort of invented as some sort of PR stunt. This is a um, term that's been used by ecologists for decades. Um, ecologists and scientists have been studying temperate rainforests around the world uh, for, for quite some time. And, um, you know, we're more familiar with tropical rainforests, of course, you know, talking about the tropical rainforests of the Amazon or the Congo Basin or Indonesia. Um, and, you know, tropical rainforests are obviously rainy and hot. But there is also temperate rainforests and temperate rainforests are rainy but cool and that's the sort that we have here in in Britain. So essentially rainforests are woods where it's wet and mild enough for plants to grow on other plants, the epiphytes that I was just referring to, the, like the ferns, the mosses, like liverworts and lichens that I'll explore in a lot more detail in, in a moment and show you lots of lots of pictures of. Um, and in Britain it takes you know roughly 1400 millimetres of rainfall a year to generate rainforest. There are various other um, criteria uh, for uh, the habitat to thrive, kind of sufficiently equable, mild climate all year round, so that you're not getting too hot in the summer and not get, getting too cold in the winter. Um, and I'll show you a map in, in shortly about where we think the rainforest zone approximates to in and in, in across Britain. And a uh, spoiler that Dumfries and Galloway are involved, as you'll be delighted to hear. Um, but just a bit about some of these pictures I'm showing here on this slide, just to kind of illustrate the fact that temperate rainforest is a, is a scientific term. Uh, you know, it, it, it sounds romantic and exotic perhaps to us thinking about woodlands here in Britain, but it is, it is something that, as I say, people have been studying for some time. This slightly odd looking uh, chart in the top, top corner of the, this slide um, is a, a, a diagram that comes from a study by an ecologist called Robert Whittaker, written in 1975, where he uh, tried to explore this idea of biomes or kind of groups of ecosystems around the world, uh, one of which um, is temperate rainforest, as you can see here. And that's, he, he defined it as being, you know, having a kind of a boundary or a kind of a zone in which temperate rainforest can occur according to a, a combination of, um, you know, the kind of mean annual rainfall and um, mean annual temperature. And you can sort of see that there's a kind of uh, ecological space or niche in which he's trying to define temperate rainforest as existing. And over the time, as this habitat's become more studied, we've had more and more uh, information kind of pulled together around it. Um, Paul Alabak, whose studies uh, I've sort of pulled, pulled out the uh, headline of there, uh, the title of there at the bottom, uh, wrote a quite seminal paper in 1991 talking about temperate rainforests in the Americas, but also trying to extrapolate a model for how to map temperate rainforest around the world. Um, he started to refer to temperate rainforest as existing in Britain and particularly in Scotland. And then more recently, we've had this book here um, published by, uh, written by Dominic de la Sala, 2011, which is I think one of the first global studies of temperate and boreal rainforests of the world. So we hear, hear a lot more about tropical rainforest, uh, very understandably they're you know, obviously much bigger um, uh, and contain even more carbon and, and vastly more biodiversity, but actually temperate rainforests are also incredibly special and uh, in some ways even rarer, actually rarer on a global level than, than tropical rainforests. So they share some of the characteristics in terms of the raininess, they're clearly cooler, um, but they're very, very special as well in their own regard, and we do have them here in, in the UK, and we'll see a bit more about where in a, in a, bit, in a minute. But I wanted to show you, firstly, a few more pretty pictures, really, to give you a sense of what they're like, um, if you haven't seen them before. 
this is uh, this is not my photo. This is a photo by uh, a much better photographer than me, by a professional photographer called Tom Williams of Wisman's Wood, which is probably one of the more, more famous um, temperate rainforests in England, at least. And I think uh, it wonderfully captures um, the sense of a microclimate that can also exist in these temperate rainforest. It's not just the fact that it's it's incredibly wet on Dartmoor, which is where Westman's Wood is, but it's it, the the very habitat itself also uh, generates something of its own microclimate underneath the canopy of the oaks. Um, you can sort of see the the mist that's blown in off the moor and is clinging to the trees and uh, you know the, the extra moisture in the atmosphere that this creates through shading and so on. Um, and you know a lot of the trees here again are, are composed of oaks. Uh, we find uh, tend to find that. Um, the Oak uh, Hazel province uh, of the west coast of Britain uh, you know, is, is the sort of uh, mixture of trees that predominates in, in our um, temperate rainforests, but there are other species as well. And uh, in, in fact, in the past, there may well have been um, a greater variety of species in our, in our temperate rainforests, as in all of our woods, because we've ended up managing them and selecting certain species for timber and, and other uses. So you find ash, you find rowan, you find hawthorn, you find birch and also you find and this is particularly um uh not unique but uh special uh in within uh, scotland is atlantic hazelwood and this is something that a lot of work has been done on by um, a wonderful botanical power couple uh called uh, sandy and brian coppins and this is their book here i recommend getting it um if you're interested in this about atlantic hazel brought out about a decade ago um, and one of the sort of first real sort of studies looking at Atlantic hazelwood as a kind of subset, a flavour, if you like, of, of temperate rainforest. This picture uh, was, I took on a, a, a visit I made to Balachu in hazelwood on the Isle of Seal um, in Argyll. So it's a um, wonderful example of Atlantic hazelwood, probably very, very old indeed, may well date back to um, after, shortly after the last ice age. Uh, and may may well not have been disturbed by 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 people very much at all. Um, often we think of hazels as being occurring in hedgerows or as coppices, um, and the sorts of hazels that we see in coppices are, you know, often you know, quite heavily pruned. Obviously, that's the whole point. You had a coppice rotation, uh, and the limbs of the hazel tree, the branches, um, tend to be quite bare. But what happens when you leave hazel is it not only does it have that kind of almost self coppicing uh, sending up uh, new shoot, new young shoots, but also uh, you get a huge number of lichens and uh, fungi and mosses that start to colonize um, the uncoppiced branches. And so it's very exciting to find examples of this because it's so rare and so under-recognized. Um, and whilst it's most widespread in, in Scotland and the west coast of Scotland, as I say, we think we are starting to see very small patches of it um, in other parts of the west of Britain, I've started to find examples potentially in the West Country, working with a, a botanist down here, um, where maybe the kind of old uncoppiced hazels that have obviously not been coppiced for a very long time now, it's sort of died out as, a, as an art form, um, are starting to be colonised again by some of these rarer species of lichens and fungi, some of which we'll see very shortly. Um, so... To move on from the kind of the trees um, to talk about the other plants that characterize our temperate rainforest, the, the epiphytic plants that grow on the branches, on the trunks, in the canopies of the trees themselves. This is just a very common example, uh, arguably probably found uh, sort of outside the rainforest zone as well, but it is um, the sort of sheer profusion of them, I think, are a good indicator that you may be, may be standing in a rainforest. And this is polypody fern. And I just love seeing trees that are come surrounded with this green halo of polypody ferns, particularly when it's on a sunny day and you can catch the light glinting through them, uh, like here, and the sort of stained glass window effect of, uh, of, of you know, this wonderful light going through the green the chlorophyll and, and illuminating the branches. Um, so that's something you can look out for um, as a potential indicator that you're, you're standing in a rainforest. But also, I think, if you start to get into this um, in a big way, I, I urge you to become a lichen and bryophyte geek. Um, it's something that I became in the process of doing this. I'm, I put my hands up right now. I'm not a trained ecologist. I'm a very amateur natu naturalist. Um, I'm pro I'm pro I'll probably say things that are wrong. Uh, and if there are botanical experts amongst you, please pick me up on it when I do. But um, I, I guess I guess what I found wonderful about getting interested in this is 
um, how welcoming the, the, the kind of botanical discipline is because there clearly aren't enough of us who care about plants uh, and fungi and there need to be more, I mean, you know, botany degrees uh, in England, at least, I, I don't know if this is the case in Scotland as well, but the last botany degree um, closed its doors some years ago now. Uh, we don't even teach it in, in universities anymore. Um, and uh, more broadly, I think we as a society suffer from plant blindness, this kind of condition that many of us have, myself included, that, you know, up until a few years ago, I, I could barely tell you the name of any wildflowers. Um, we're so cut off from nature, I think. And um, still more so, I think, when it comes to what is somewhat, somewhat disparagingly termed the lower plants, the, the lichens, the bryophytes, and so on, mosses and liverworts. Um, you know, lower plants, but in fact, in some ways, some of the most charismatic and interesting plants, I think. So this one here particularly, I think, I, I love it. Tree lungwort, Labaria pulmonaria, um, sounds to me like a wizarding spell out of Harry Potter and uh, is equally as uh, magical and enchanting as, as, as any tale of witchcraft and wizardry, I think and gets its more common name, tree lung work, from um, uh, medieval herbalists who were kind of besotted with this idea of the doctrine of signatures, which is that plants that uh, were seen to have particular medicinal purposes um, uh, as a result of their appearance. So, you know, this, this lichen looks a little bit, if you screw up your eyes, looks a little bit like the kind of inside of a lung, the alveoli, the kind of air sacs there. Um, a mottled surface and so it was it was uh, surmised that it was good for curing you know pulmonary diseases uh, ailments uh, like you know uh, pneumonia and coughs and colds there's no scientific evidence that it does so quite apart from it being incredibly rare I please don't do anything like picking lichens like these to try and uh, cure any diseases um, there may be evidence for some of them but we, we need to keep uh, make sure that they're um, kept preserved and uh, and uh, and allowed to thrive um, a few other a few other denizens of our temperate rainforest, uh, filmy fern, beautiful little tiny fern that um, looks more like a kind of moss, but actually is is, is part of the kind of um, you know, fern genus, and it's it's uh, particularly found in amazing uh, amazingly wet spots where you can find whole clumps of it growing underneath waterfalls and in streams or on the side of streams. And stick to sylvatica is um, perhaps not so much to look at, but is one of this um, one of those lichens which has, for some bizarre reason, uh, which for which I have no idea what possible evolutionary purpose this has, but it smells of rotting fish. So I had to include it because it's definitely one to to look out for and and to smell if you find one in the woods. A um, couple of other examples here. Um, one which is particularly more found in Scotland, um, this uh, lichen here, I think it's now called Pectenia Atlantica, but is shown here as Degalia Atlantica. Um, and this is also an excuse for me to plug uh, Plant Life's amazing uh, plant ID guides. Um, they do a whole bunch of ID guides like these that you can uh, waterproof so they survive any trip to the rainforest um, and uh, were very helpful for, for um, IDing lichens and, uh, and mosses. And um, Probably my favorite species that characterizes temperate rainforest is uh, this one here, hazel glass fungus. And someone once described it to me as looking like Donald Trump's tiny orange hands, um, which I think is, you know, obviously a slightly off-putting image, um, but I think it's pretty amazing still. Uh, I think it's incredibly charismatic, um, which I think we should think about species of fungi and plants as being charismatic. We talk about charismatic megafauna, you know, the, the lions and, and tigers and bears and pandas of the world, which obviously are very charismatic and absolutely in need of preserving and protecting uh, as well. But I think we need to look more closely at the things, you know, some of the charismatic species that are right under our noses um, that are, you know, arguably at least in, as important in, you know, in the kind of the food chain and you know, the plants that everything else uh, depends upon. And hazel glass fungus, um, is something that, uh, you know, a species that's found, again, particularly in the west coast of Scotland, um, but can also be found um, in sort of the most unusual places. This, this example was shown to me by a young, young Cornish botanist called Billy Fullwood, and he took me to uh, the outskirts of an industrial estate in Bodmin in Cornwall, and there was just an absolute profusion of them growing on these old hazel trees that had clearly kind of regenerated and not been coppiced. And so, you know, nature crops up in all the most incredible places that even, you know, you think that it's sort of been expunged from all corners of our 
countryside, but there are places where it clings on, which is which is wonderful. Um, it's not all about the plants and the, and the lichens uh, as much as I go on about them. Um, temperate rainforests obviously support an amazing variety of birds and mammals and invertebrates too. And this is just one of one of the invertebrates that um, you find in our temperate rainforest. It's uh, called um, it's called uh, the blue ground beetle, and um, I'm very proud that it's found in a handful of sites just uh, near to where I live uh, around Dartmoor. Um, so uh, I think it's actually just been found in a few more locations. Um, so it's, it's perhaps it's spreading, which is good because it's it's incredibly rare and feeds on, and when it comes out at night, it feeds on slugs, which is uh, possibly a useful part of the part of the ecosystem to be doing that. So that's great. Um, obviously, these places are incredibly, incredibly important for biodiversity. Temperate rainforests are also brilliant allies in the fight against climate change. Um, you know, we obviously hear a lot about planting trees and trees being good for soaking up carbon. Well, all woodlands, of course, do soak up carbon in their trunks and in their um, lock it up in their in, in the kind of um, woody matter that comprises their, their branches and trunks. But I think why, maybe what is going on in temperate rainforests is something additional to that, which is that all the profusion of um, epiphytic plants that are growing on the um, branches of the trees are starting to form a soil in the canopy of the trees. So not just the soil that forms on the forest floor, but an actual soil that's forming in the canopy. And this is something that's been studied in tropical rainforests, um, where um, some scientists have found that there's actually a significant amount of carbon that's being stored and locked up in tropical rainforest canopy soils, as they call them. And I wonder if something similar is going on in temperate rainforests as well. It's not something I think has been properly peer-reviewed science yet, so take it with a pinch of salt, but uh, you can see what's going on here in this photo uh, of a temperate rainforest on, along the Dart River. Um, generations of mosses have lived and died on this same branch and have started to form this huge thick crust of soil-like material held together by all the rhizomes of the polypody ferns. So something is clearly going on there that I think merits further study uh, and is, uh, in my mind, another reason for doing more to restore and protect them and, and expand our temperate rainforests. So where do we find temperate rainforests in Britain? Um, so we saw some pioneering studies earlier of looking at this, um, you know, this biome globally, but what do we know about Britain specifically? Well, um, you know, when I first um, moved to Devon, I was enchanted by finding examples of this habitat, um, hadn't really realized how much of it still existed um, and finding, finding fragments of it near to where I lived. And I, and I decided that, um, I would just start by asking people. I would start by putting out, um, you know, setting up a Google map um, like this one, um, starting a blog and uh, putting out a request on Twitter if anybody had seen any sign of anything that they thought looked like temperate rainforests where they where they lived. And lo and behold, hundreds of people um, ended up sending me submissions. I was kind of quite overwhelmed by the number that got sent in. I think at the last count. Um, the last update of the map that I, I worked on with, with a number of other people who came and helped helped with it, we had about 450 submissions of different sites. So that gives you a sense of, of how potentially how widespread um, this habitat could be. But to emphasize, we're talking about very, very tiny fragments that are clinging on still. The overall area of what we're talking about is very, very small. So this was a bit of um, kind of quite loose citizen science. I knew it wasn't going to be a kind of, uh, you know, absolutely perfect peer-reviewed bit of scientific literature here. And, and clearly, as I say, lots of ecologists have been studying these habitats for, for some time. So um, to, to, uh, to, to kind of create a more detailed map, I decided to go one step further and um, worked with a digital mapping specialist called Tim Richards um, to try and map Britain's temperate rainforest zone and our remaining fragments of rainforest. And to do this, we built on work that had been previously done by a guy called Professor Christopher Ellis. He works at the Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh. Um, he'd done a, an amazing paper in 2016, um, mapping the Britain's rainforest zone. Um, and so essentially what we ended up doing, Tim and I, was to just to try and update his analysis very slightly by using some more recent uh, Met Office rainfall and temperature records that have been published since his, uh, since his paper came out. And then also to try and combine that with uh, a measure of existing uh, surviving temperate rainforest fragments. And by our reckoning, around 20% of Britain has a suitable climate for temperate rainforests, which is um, the map you can see here with a more colorful uh, map here uh, on the left, showing 
um, areas in green through to purple. And that simply is uh, trying to give you a sense of um, a measure of the, the oceanicity of the climate, as it's sometimes called, the essentially how rainy and mild it is. And as you can see, um, going from green is the kind of least, or well, white is the absolute least, but the green is, is the least within the rainforest zone through to purple, you can see that the west coast of Scotland has an absolute shed load of, of, uh, of, of land where it's, uh, the, the, the climate is suitable for rainforest. But what is actually left is incredibly small. Um, fortunately, um, less than 1% of uh, the country remains rainforest today. If you want to look at this sort of these sorts of maps in more detail, it's a fully interactive online map now um, at the URL here, map.lostrainforestbritain.org. Um, and I've so zoomed in here to give you a better sense of the um, rainforest zone that we reckon uh, exists in, in Scotland. Just to sort of explain a little bit about how we built this. So yeah, so the, the zone itself is, is determined through a kind of combination of rainfall and temperature records from, from Met Office publicly uh, available data. Um, and for the rainforest fragments, what we ended up alighting on was basically to take uh, a series of data sets called ancient woodland inventories, um, which have been produced separately for Scotland, um, England, and Wales. We combined them, took out some of the sites that are mentioned in them that uh, are things like plantations on ancient woodlands, which are clearly are, are not uh, no longer ancient, ancient woodlands themselves, although they do have uh, characteristics of ancient woodland in the soils, um, and and then sort of combined them and cropped them by the, uh, the the climatic layer to try and get a sense of how how big the um, surviving rainforest uh, ecosystem was. And just to zoom in a little bit further to the area where I know most of you will probably be interested, to Dumfries and Galloway, and as you can see, um, there clearly is here a. Uh, and a considerable area where, um, you know, going by going by the mapping we've done, and also by what Krista Ellis mapped uh, earlier on in, in, in 2016, um, there is a part of the uh, of the county that's is um, suitable for temperate rainforest. In fact, is goes into the hyperoceanic climate zone here. Um, that's the area shown in darker blue and purple, and that simply is a, a you know kind of an index, a slightly higher scoring. Uh, area where it is very very wet indeed um, as I'm sure many of you will know far better than me um, uh, and we think is you know potentially um, really suitable for, for some quite you know interesting habitats. Um, just to explain one last thing on this slide the all the colored dots the pink and purple little dots uh, now scattered over that over the map these are showing um, lichen and bryophyte records uh, that we attained through two things, but basically we worked with um, an amazing bryologist based in Scotland called Ben Averis. Um, he's done a huge amount of work uh, looking at, te at temperate rainforests um, and other habitats. And he came up with a, a list of indicator species of you know, lichens and bryophytes that he considers to be potentially ca uh, characteristic of rainforests. Um, and then we source the data sets, the records that have been um, you know, the sightings that have been recorded for these uh, species from something called the National Biodiversity Network Atlas and uh, combine them together into this into this map. So what happened to our rainforests? Why is there, um, why is it something that once perhaps covered 20% of Britain and now only covers less than 1%? Well, the tragedy is that Britain was a rainforest nation that has cut down most of its rainforests. And, you know, some of that deforestation took place as long ago as the Bronze Age, you know, uh, in this sort of recreation of a Bronze Age uh, forester felling a birch tree here with a Bronze Age axe. You know, I can't get too angry about that. It happened a long time ago. And obviously people were kind of all engaged in pretty subsistence living at the time to try and get fuel and uh, create farmland for, 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 you know, for feeding themselves. But what I think I can get a bit more justifiably angry about is the fact that some of our temperate rainforests were cut down by uh, modern forestry as recently as the 20th century. And, you know, modern forestry practices that sort of were started to be pioneered from the 1930s onwards, all the way through to the 70s and, and perhaps arguably beyond, I saw many of our ancient temperate, temperate rainforests fell to make way for conifer plantations. And, you know, I know this is a, this is a big issue in Galloway, 
um, with all the forestry plantations that have been established in your your area over the years, um, you know, across Western Britain, um, many of the many of our ancient woodlands, uh, in, in fact, up to a third of our ancient woodlands, it's thought, were felled between the 1950s and the 1980s. Uh, much of it for for plantation forestry, which is just kind of staggering, really, when we you know kind of think about the damage that that has that has caused over the years. Um, in fact, it was um, uh, the kind of proto hippies of the Dartington Estate, uh, just down the road from where I live in in Devon, who kind of really pioneered this modern deforestation drive. And um, they, uh, when when um, a couple called uh, Dorothy and uh, Leonard Elmhurst took over the Dartington Estate in the 1920s and tried to revive it as a kind of as a rural business. Um, uh, they got quite interested in modern forestry practices. They employed an economist called Wilfred Hiley, who's shown in this picture here. And basically, the economist, uh, he, told, he told them, well, what you've got to do is you've got to get rid of all of these scrubby old ancient oaks, and you've got to cut them down, and you've got to replace them with, um, you know, fast-growing, efficient, profit-making conifer plantations instead. And that's what they did to many, many of the temperate rainforests in, in, um, on their estates in this part of the world. So a bit of a tragedy, really. And, um, you know, we can argue about whether they knew what they were doing at the time, whether they knew the fuel, full <coughs> ecological consequences of what they were doing. But nevertheless, whether or not they did, we have to live with that today. And we have to live with um, the, <coughs> the impact of doing so. And how to try and put some of these um, ancient woodlands back together from the, the remnants that were remaining. So after slashing and burning, in come the livestock to finish the job. So you've heard of rainforest beef destroying the Amazon. This is our equivalent, it's rainforest mutton. Um, and sheep in particular, being a non-native species to the UK, do tend to nibble vegetation down to a very small tight sward um, and you know we'll also eat tree saplings um, more so than cattle which is which is why often you find in conservation grazing projects that cattle are deployed um, in preference to sheep and of course in Scotland uh, an even bigger problem uh, is deer and the huge numbers of deer unnaturally high populations of deer that now uh, will nibble and browse um, saplings and trees and cause huge amounts of damage in Scotland's forests. Now, if you think that the number of sheep we have in Britain is just natural and perfectly fine, um, I hope this map will disabuse you of any such notion. This map shows the sheep density of Europe. It's a wonderful map that I found online. And um, uh, yellow is low density, red is high density. You can see that Britain is truly world beating when it comes to sheep here. And if you zoom in even further, looking at some uh, DEFRA statistics, here um, and, and other, uh, uh, other devolved uh, um, agency and ministry statistics here on numbers of, numbers of sheep in Britain, you can see that unfortunately the highest densities of sheep in Britain tend to occur in our rainforest zone. And this of course actually isn't a coincidence because as any farmer will tell you, the west of Britain is clearly very good for growing grass. But in my opinion, it's even better for growing temporary rainforests. So. We have to contend with that. We have to do something to work out how um, we can manage and control the numbers uh, and ideally reduce the numbers of sheep grazing in our in our temperate rainforest areas. Because I think with, without any further controls, we are gonna see the remaining fragments continue to um, get older and die without bringing forward a new generation of saplings and certainly won't be able to expand. Because this is what happens to a rainforest when it's badly overgrazed. This is um, a dying rainforest in the highlands, um, been overgrazed by sheep and particularly by deer. It's a picture that was taken by an ecologist um, who tweets as uh, Cole Bradan, if you're on Twitter, give him a follow. Um, and it shows, as he discovered, these last few veteran trees, uh, particularly birch trees shown here, just really falling over, um, you know, kind of dying on their feet, become senescent. You know, they'll have sent out thousands of seeds over the years to try and bring forward a, a fresh generation of, of, of trees, but, um, you know, all of the saplings will have been grazed or browsed away. 
And what we've ended up with is tiny fragments of temperate rainforests, marooned up hillsides in the middle of moorlands, often lacking in ecological connectivity. And you know, because so many of our rainforests have disappeared, they've been nibbled to death, I think we need to undertake some pretty careful detective work to track down their remains. And one of the world's experts on temperate rainforests, the ecologist Dominic Della Sala, whose book I mentioned earlier, has said, and I quote, because very few rainforests remain throughout Europe, they have not received much attention even from ecologists. Those undertaking rescue efforts today operate much like detectives in search of clues, which I think is just a wonderful way of thinking about how we need to start looking at landscapes so as, as detectives, we need to start understanding um, what, what are the clues that we can use to um, locate and rebuild some of these temperate rainforests. So who better to call on than Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson here out looking for ghostly hounds in the fog of Dartmoor. And whilst the Hound of the Baskervilles um, has Sherlock Holmes and Watson tracking down a ghostly hound, there's something else that's haunting our, lands our landscapes today, and that is the spectre of ghostwoods. Ghostwoods is a term invented by the ecologist Ian Rotherham uh, to describe woods that are now lost. The trees may no longer be present, but there may be other clues as to the formerly wooded nature of the area still found to be found in old place names and in old maps. And this is one such ghostwood uh, shown here on an old ordnance survey map, courtesy of the wonderful National Library of Scotland's website, um, next to aerial imagery of how it now looks, um, where you can see there's only a few scattered trees left uh, remaining. Uh, and again, I'd like to thank the ecologist Cole Bredan for first highlighting, highlighting this example to me. And I guess in Scotland as well, you also have um, the Roy maps from 1750 or so, um, which allows you to delve back even further than the original ordnance survey maps. And I think it's a really interesting to start to kind of build a sense of how an ecosystem has looked in past ages and over time, and is a crucial part of how we can, can think about bringing back uh, lost landscapes in the future. More clues to lost rainforests and lost woodlands can come from the buried seed banks of former woods, from woodland indicator species of plants that uh, you start cropping up in places where there are no actual woodlands left. You know, the examples of this can include bluebells, for example. You know, you sometimes often will find great drifts of bluebells in um, in kind of woodland glades, but often you can also find them in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of moorlands, um, where they're completely exposed. Um, and uh, some, some ecologists have, you know, suggested that these are actually the remnants of old woodland soils. Um, Wood sorrel is another such um, potential woodland indicator species. And bracken, um, you know, a lot of people sort of think bracken is a bit of a menace in our, in our countryside today, see it as, um, you know, it, it can form these sort of dense monoculture stands that are unpalatable, even poisonous to some livestock. So farm, farmers tend to hate it. Conservationists sometimes, when it particularly becomes a really dense monoculture, also see it as being something that needs to be um, needs to be bashed and, and uh, you know, kind of kept back. But I think it can also be telling us something that actually the soils in which it's growing tend to be well drained and they may well be old woodland soils um, where they bracken previously would have uh, would have existed in, in smaller quantities underneath the, the, the shadow and the canopy of the trees. One of the things that I'm interested in is in, in trying to try and knit back knit back together some of our lost rainforests is whether we can use maps of where bracken is now uh, forming a dense monoculture to help guide restoration efforts. Um, because of advances in kind of satellite remote sensing, uh, there's been more and more work being done looking at kind of vegetation maps of, of Britain using these sort of satellite images. And um, one of the things that's been done recently is, is uh, the production of a series of maps of bracken um, in some of our national parks. Um, and this this one of uh, this map showing you um, Dartmoor bracken over Dartmoor shows how much of a huge area is now dominated by bracken stands. It's about six percent of the entire national park, and I think um, I think Dartmoor has got about six six percent woodland cover. So um, you know, if we were to allow 
uh, some assisted regeneration over these bracken stands, you can see how quite quickly we would uh, double uh, woodland cover without Im impacting on any sort of productive uh, farmland. So, you know, some of this presentation had, to date has sounded a bit depressing, talking about lost rainforests and ghost woods and sheep and deer just destroying our habitats. So I, I actually have huge hope for the future because in the words of the legendary Jeff Goldblum in Jurassic Park, life finds a way. And life finds a way because often it's just waiting to regenerate if we, if we let it. Um, I think we need to be doing a lot more, not just to plant trees in the landscape, but to allow trees to naturally regenerate and bring with them all the other amazing species that characterize our temperate rainforests. Um, and we have, because we still have these fragments of rainforest buried in our, in our, in our landscapes, they are essentially like uh, lifeboats, really, um, that, you know, have these, this precious cargo of, you know, see the seed banks, the lichens, the bryophytes, waiting to kind of spread again out into the wider landscape. And when we prevent the overgrazing of of our landscapes, we start to see some pretty dramatic effects, you know, putting in things like biodegradable tree guards uh, or exclosure fencing. Um, simple, a simple fence line can, which excludes livestock, can do an enormous amount to uh, encourage the regeneration of, of trees and other, other plants. This is just one simple example from um, Snowdonia, Cadaridris, um, in Wales. And you can see quite clearly where the fence uh, line goes down the centre of the, the photo. And um, you know, on the left, the grazing by sheep has continued apace. But for the last 20 or 30 years or so that, since the fence has been put in, on the right hand side where the sheep have been kept out, rowans have started to appear, birch, other trees, uh, heather and bilberries and so on. And this is nowhere near a good sea source, by the way. This is just um, birds and other animals that have brought the seeds and dropped them there and they've started to sprout again. And another example that I found of, uh, of, of quite startling natural regeneration of a, of a rainforest, what I've called an accidental rainforest, uh, has taken place on a common, um, again, quite close to where I live, um, up on the edge of Dartmoor, it's a place called Lustley Cleave. And it's, it's this, a story uh, that we can chart through time just by looking at old paintings and old postcards, looking back 200 years or so to uh, this painting in the top left-hand corner here um, is a painting that was uh, done in about 1820. Um, this is just a, a, sub, a small section of the painting in the full thing. You can actually uh, see a herd of, uh, sorry, a flock of sheep grazing at the base of the cleave, uh, and giving you a sense of, of how much it was uh, grazed at the time. Uh, and it's completely bereft of, of any vegetation back then. And you spool forward to this Edwardian postcard here, dated 1907, uh, and you can see that the vegetation has started to creep up the sides of the of, of the hill and uh, up onto the tor. And I went back in 2021 to try and find the same spot where the painting had been painted and the photograph had been taken, and I couldn't find the exact spot because there were so many trees in the way. And obviously, it's not just about trees coming back; it's about all the other species that are starting to colonise and, and regenerate as well. I guess if we were to just simply rely on this sort of accidental rainforest kind of coming about through land abandonment, I doubt we would see it actually happening in that many places. And I, ideally, we really want to encourage this uh, to happen with the full, you know, uh, in, not just the consent, but the active buy-in of farmers and landowners, um, where incentives have been geared to encourage this sort of nature restoration and, you know, done alongside food production uh, and, you know, kind of sustainable harvesting of, of, of products of the forest and so on. So, you know, that's where I'm hoping the debate is starting to go. In, in England, we have the new system in environmental land management schemes starting to be put in place. Um, I'm, I'm not so familiar with, uh, with where things are at in, in terms of the debate about post-Brexit farm payments in Scotland, but I, I'm sure things are moving in, in a similar direction, I, I would hope. Um, and I guess that brings me to, to one of my last slides, which is, which is to say that I think besides um, wonderful work by members of the public and farmers and landowners to try and raise the alarm about this and ecologists to study it, 
I think we need political action uh, to get our temperate rainforests back in, 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 in good working order again as well. And um, the Alliance of Scotland's Rainforests, which has been campaigning in Scotland since I think about 2019, has been doing some fantastic work, um, amazing alliance of, of different environmental NGOs and, and others like the Woodland Trust, Plant Life, John Muir Trust and others. And um, has clearly managed to push uh, Scotland's rainforests um, very high up the political agenda, particularly in a big way in 2021 when I think it, it really you know kind of broke through and featured in uh, various party manifestos ahead of ahead of the Scottish elections uh, and in the run up to the COP26 climate talks, which obviously took place in Glasgow. And uh, you know since since uh, then the alliance has managed to elicit promises of funding and support from uh, the Scottish government, although. My understanding is this obviously still a long way to go and, and much more that needs to be done still to kind of get um, the funding put in place uh, at, at the scale that's needed to to kind of start to tackle things like deer invasive species like rhododendron and and overgrazing and i guess i felt that we needed to learn um from this uh, in england and get westminster politicians doing more too so in parallel to writing my book i, I started campaigning in, in 2020 to get the UK government to, to do more to protect and re restore our lost rainforests as well. And, you know, the results so far, I have to say, have been have been mixed. We're dealing with a government that may now be on its way out, of course, uh, at Westminster. Um, but we have been able to get some support from ministers uh, and from their shadow, you know, shadow counterpart ministers. We've uh, you know managed to get quite a lot of people signing petitions, talking to their MPs, getting temperate rainforests mentioned for the first time in Parliament getting it into some of the first uh, government documents to ever, to ever mention this, habit, uh, this habitat in, in, at the UK government level. And, and also to start to put in place some of the first uh, bare bones of, of uh, funding for, for restoring this habitat in England uh, as well. There's clearly huge and growing momentum for change. Just the other week, the Wildlife Trust announced um, a, a really impre very impressive 38 million pounds in funding that they've been able to secure from pension company Aviva to, to restore temperate rainforests across the UK and I think that may be just the tip of the iceberg in terms of uh, landowners and farmers starting to come on board with with doing this sort of restoration work so I think we should be setting a goal of doubling the area of our rainforests within a generation I think it's something that's eminently achievable even just through uh, the process of, of natural regeneration and I've been incredibly inspired to and feel incredibly lucky to have got to see so many amazing temperate rainforests over the last couple of years of, of, of reading and researching this book. Um, I hope you too feel really inspired and want to take up the fight and start to bring back Galloway, Galloway's lost rainforests as well. And of course, one thing that I would love you all to do uh, as a first step is to buy my book. Brilliant. That was just folded in so neatly at the end there, Guy. I hardly noticed. Um, a, a brilliant presentation. Thank you. It was great to see some applause, virtual applause, quite sure how it works, coming up on the bottom of the screen there. So that's absolutely superb. Um, really enjoyed the presentation. I think it's, it's, it's starting to think if there was a single embodiment of Scottish soft power on the global stage, it is probably the map section of the National Library of Scotland website, because it's so interesting to see that pop up in different presentations and to see how, how it's been sort of utilised as a resource, which is absolutely amazing. Um, I, ha I have read your book. I'm obviously trying not to use the phrase that everyone says at this time as, oh, guy, I love the book. Um, but, but I really did. I really did love the book. And there's a couple of points in it I wanted to pick up on. There's questions coming through here. I really like the idea that um, planting trees is not 100% is not of the answer. It's a good start. We've got to plant trees. But um, there was a comment made at an event the other week about in ways uh, Scotland could be looked at as an old people's home of trees. And I thought that was quite an interesting angle of, of when you're looking at native trees, it's like an old people's home and you can think the numbers are there, and, but actually it's the, it's the understory coming through. And I, you, you picked up on that in your book a bit, isn't it? It's not just, we can't plant our way out of this is what you're trying to say. It's, it needs some natural regeneration to, to come through. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, I do think that, um... Tree planting has its place, but it's become a bit of a kind of civic religion, really. Um, you know, we go out um, and uh, you know every every National Tree Week or whatever, and in, in November and December, and get a spade and stick it in the ground and put a sapling in, and that's our that's our environmental job done for the year. Um, you know, sorry to sound a little bit cynical about it, and obviously it's done on a far a far vaster scale by by forestry companies. Um, but I do think you know we we risk creating. Um, you know, a, a set of, of 
I guess you could call them woods, but potentially more plantations for the future that actually we will look back on in the future and go, oh, gosh, this is odd. Why are all these trees uh, all of exactly the same age? Why are they of only a very limited number of species? Why, where's all the rest of the, where's the understory? Where's, you know, where's everything else that we, you know, thought that, uh, uh, you know, biologically diverse woodland should, should involve. And I think, you know, age structure is something that, you know, is really important about uh, natural woodlands and natural temperate rainforests is that, you know, you have this, the veteran trees that have been, you know, been bashed about a bit over the years. They've got full of knot holes and bits that have been rotting and dropping off them that, you know, beetles can live in, grubs can live in. Then you get the, the um, you know, the birds coming along, the pied flycatchers, the red starts and so on, living on those invertebrates. Uh, you get, you know, everything else starting to come in you, but you also have to have the young trees, you have to have young saplings. And, and I think, you know, a, a lot of, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of the 20th century was spent basically denigrating scrub. It was spent, you know, bashing scrub, getting rid of it, clearing away brambles and... It, it serves thorn. no purpose. Yeah, absolutely. It, yeah. Because we saw it as being something that was, you know, getting in the way and, of, of agriculture and so on. And, and, you know, I think we need to, unfortunately, we need to do a lot of work to put it back and to allow it to come back. Yeah. The um, Brilliant. I've got a couple more questions. One of them is absolutely brilliant, but I'll save that just for a moment. So uh, are, the, are the groups being created? I live on the edge of Snowdonia. Are the groups being created? I think this question's coming at, at how how can people get involved or is there a, is there a local? Uh, great, great. Gosh, yes. I, I hadn't as been able to see where everyone's coming from. Obviously, people are coming from all, all, all parts of the UK and perhaps beyond. Uh, so. I think actually so someone's trying to book you for an American uh, chat show as well, guys. We need to ch check up on that in a minute. But yeah, if we can cut to you doing it. fun trip for me to go to the sea, the Pacific uh, Northwest. <laughs> uh, talk to me afterwards, definitely. Um, uh, so, so, so local groups and, and so on. Well, there are, um, so I didn't mention this because I didn't actually expect anyone to be joining from Wales, but there is also Celtic Rainforest Wales. Um, and I believe that might be, uh, it's, it's been a kind of more practically focused set of projects up until now, but I believe it's also becoming um, more of a kind of campaigning group going forward. And membership and things than you think. Potentially also, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, but if you visit the Celtic Rainforest Wales uh, website, they will hopefully have more details there of what they'll be doing in future and how they're evolving uh, and how you can get involved. Um, if you don't find anything in your area, then obviously I have to encourage you to set something up yourself. <laughs> and, you know, whether that's just simply a kind of botany, you know, botany group to go out and start looking for these fragments or um you know something where you feel comfortable lobbying your mp or getting involved with some of the more political aspects of it everything will help so yeah um uh, a question here just in case you didn't think you have your hands full at the moment looking at britain's rainforests a question about other countries with atlantic rainforest elements in it uh, where they might have rural communities more connected to the ecosystem whether they're using foraging or handicrafts is there any outreach to those communities for sharing of knowledge or inspiration, such as sort of an Atlantic Rainforest Alliance of sorts, or is there yeah, anything? Well, um, in, in the tottering pile of books next to me, I have another book about rainforests, which <laughs> I can also recommend by a guy called Owen Dalton. He brought this out just recently as well, an Irish Atlantic Rainforest. He, uh, if you're on Twitter, he tweets as at Irish Rainforest and does the most amazing photos. Um, of the rainforest that he has been looking after himself, but also of, of many others in, in uh, the west coast of Ireland. And certainly in terms of the Atlantic seaboard, um, you know, Ireland clearly gets the full brunt of uh, the rain and the wind that comes across the Atlantic. Um, and so there's some amazing examples there as well. Um, I'm, I'm led to believe that there may be temperate rainforests in places like Galicia uh, okay. and Portugal yeah. as well. I suspect it'd be quite a different sort of um, uh, a woodland there, a rainforest there, but um, there may well be also um, similarities in terms of of species and uh, and certainly. Uh, I, I, I think there's a book in that somewhere. I think I have to. Just a question here, which um, I suppose picks up on the sort of challenge, really, of 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 the of the angle is how. What what do we wear? Wool impacts forest. Uh, cotton impacts water polyesters but we now we're petroleum and I suppose really this is yes talking about clothing there but I, how do you see the the balance issue there of um rainforest versus food production and um have, mm. have you have you squared it off in your mind into a into a, a pithy sort of way of handling that or sure I mean uh, I, I, yes I guess I guess the question there more broadly is, is as you say a sort of um 
do do we risk just sit, sit simply um you know turning ourselves into some sort of glorified park if we just allow nature back everywhere and, and don't actually end up producing enough food um in this country well i think the the good thing is that um you know where our where our existing temperate rainforests are clinging on is some of the least productive land of all um incredibly steep sided gorges rocky boulder fields marshy areas areas that flood you know you name it uh, and and i think that um you know that there are studies that certainly have been done in england uh, the independent national food strategy that was produced um commissioned by westminster uh, a couple of you know, last year or the year before um looked at kind of levels of food production in england and and how that differed geographically and it you know they, they kind of concluded that you you could um essentially cease food production on about 20 percent of britain's least uh, of england sorry least productive land uh, and have only a three percent impact um in terms of actual food production so uh, i don't think anyone is seriously suggesting that but I do think that what that points to is that, that, that you know, we, we don't have to make this about a trade-off, a one-for-one -one trade-off between um, producing something from the land for ourselves and, and for nature. You know, clearly there is going to be, um, you know, placed parts of, of, of Britain, parts of Scotland, parts of England that where, and Wales where, where um, you know, it would be crazy not to continue producing food there. Equally, I do think we have to think about whether some of our most marginal lands are uh, you know whether we've got the balance right you know clearly uh in the past we've seen moorland plowed up for for you know to, to sow arable crops that might be the right thing to do in some parts of of the country um i know of plenty of places in places like exmoor where that was an absolute travesty when that happened so i think i think we need to we need to think about what what we um you know how much we really need to rinse the land for everything and also we need to think about our diets you know, we know that uh, livestock, uh, both in terms of the amount of land they take up in terms of pasture, but also in terms of the crops that we end up feeding to them, takes up enormous amounts of land. And, um, you know, I do think pretty much every study and every, um, you know, committee of climate change and so on is, is, is now sort of saying we need to reduce the amount of meat and dairy in our diets, and that ultimately will free up more land. So regenerative agriculture, reducing uh, you know, to less less but better uh, meat and dairy, uh, and and I think we'll start to see actually that the trade offs are not quite so so severe as we might have feared. I mean, it's, I suppose it, it's almost it has to be discussed as the biggest the biggest issue there, isn't it? Is the limited land there? It's not a case of save one to, to for, for no loss elsewhere. It's there is a balance in there, isn't it? Um, we guy, we've got one of these interesting situations where the more questions I put to you, the more questions I have. So I have to handle this one quite carefully. I'm just going to throw some at you that right. Should we ban log burners? <laughs> um, I, I I don't know from a temperate rainforest perspective whether we should ban log burners. Um, uh certainly uh clearly I, I, and I've, I've been reading the same probably articles as as you have been uh about um you know the impact of of wood burning on uh on, on you know pm 2.5 air pollution particulates and so on i i had read something um obviously i read george monbiot's column in the guardian about this recently they got a lot of attention i did read something which i think may have been written by a scottish author about actually how Quite a lot of the data on that was to do with open fires rather than uh, more efficient uh, wood burners. But um, you know, uh, and obviously there is a difference in, in air concentrate, you know, pollution in in cities and the concentration of particulates in cities versus more rural areas. Uh, I guess I'm hedging my bets there slightly. No, no, no. I, I think you handled that um, when you woke up this morning. You didn't think you'd be fielding that. I didn't question, think that was necessarily what I'd be talking about. But no, I, I hope that is some useful <laughs> point. Anyway, the, the um, a question from Divine Wellwater here. Thank you very much, very much for the question. If we allow woods to form on their own over time, how long would it be before it becomes a rainforest? Is it several centuries, or can it be called a nascent rainforest on day one? Uh, well, that's a very interesting question, and. Um, I would suspect that, you know, if you ask ecologists about how long is it going to take for some of these very, very rare, slow moving, extremely fussy lichens to emerge and grow on some of our, our trees, it, you may well be talking in terms of centuries. Um, you know, the Labarian community of lichens, the tree lungworts and other species like, like that that are related to it, do take a very, very long time to 
kind of essentially creep along branches, you know, kind of the, 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 um, the, the fungal spores to spread and for the sori, the, the plant reproductive parts of them to get lodged into new trees. So they do, do take a very, very long time to spread. There are other species that um, have been held up as characteristic and, and uh, symptomatic of temperate rainforest, like hazel gloves fungus, that I suspect actually colonize much more quickly than perhaps we think. Um, and you know that's what we're starting to be finding in places like Cornwall and Devon, where very clearly they're not ancient woodlands where hazel gloves fungus is cropping up. These are recently regenerated clumps of hazels that haven't been coppiced for a while, that some of which are 50 to 70 years old, and you're starting to get um, you know, hazel gloves fungus appearing. And that's that's quite exciting. That I think that gives you a sense of actually, we're not just talking about restoring trees and scrub, we're talking about actually some of these other very interesting and rare species starting to come back as well. Cool, cool, because there's a complexity even to, even to that then, isn't it? Absolutely. How possible is it to transplant mosses and lichens into recent plantations? It's quite interesting. I think in your book, you mentioned that you have concerns about people being too active on that front. Uh, only, only just doing it uh, without any specialist input. Please, please don't be tempted to do that yourself. Um, but you know, and I certainly wouldn't do that. Uh, if, if you're if you're an ecologist, uh, if, if you're somebody who's done this a lot, then um, you know there are there are botanists and ecologists who've been involved in uh, the translocation of lichens of some of these rare and very slow slow to reproduce lichens. So somebody called April Windle, for example, I know has done some amazing work um, in the Lake District when. Uh, a veteran ash tree fell over containing a huge population of lungwort and um, you know it's kind of a rescue mission to try and take the living lichen and essentially cut it off the tree and glue it on to a new tree and obviously with ash dieback this is something that's going to become a bigger and bigger problem as, as more of our old and, and veteran uh, ashes die out. Um, so yes it is something that can be done um, uh, obviously the results are not necessarily all in yet because it will it will take many decades to see whether those translocations have been but, but it's but it's not a, it's not a fanciful notion it's something that has been it's not a totally fanciful notion no. <laughs> the um there's a question here uh, which i think i remember you mentioning in your book is there a couple of valleys little valleys in sussex kent that are of interest from a temperate rainforest point of view i think you mentioned that there is a very uh, might even have used the word valley did you um, uh, well, they, they're particularly called gills in Sussex, the gill woodlands, they're, they're often called. Um, and um, I, I'm going to slightly sit on the fence on this one, because uh, some people I've spoken to are absolutely adamant that there are temperate rainforests in, in Sussex. If you look at the, the maps that we I showed earlier, that it, um, you know, the climate is, is just, just way too dry um, for that to be deemed temperate rainforest. However, I'm definitely prepared to hold out the fact that there are microclimates in some of these, these, these gills, these deep-sided valleys. Um, and that may be having um, you know, you know, additional impact on allowing the flourishing of certain species. And certainly there are interesting studies that have been done by looking at um, various species of oceanic lichens that otherwise would only occur on the west coast of Britain that do appear and crop up in the Sussex Gills, so you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna hedge my bets, but it, it's it, whatever. It doesn't really matter in the end, does it? It's a very interesting ecosystem. It's great that there are places where um, and, and that's having, and you're not saying there's nothing in that in those areas. No, exactly. like that, which is, is the way the worst case scenario is. There's exactly. Yeah. 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 There's um, a question here from a board member of the Galloway Glen Scheme, so I'll make a total hash of reading it to you now, Guy, but just to say, uh, Britain has lost several native species from many areas, everything from boar and bear and beavers. What effect would they have had on tree species we expect to find in temperate rainforests? And do you think we'd have had more willow, more wild fruit trees in the past? I think, did you talk in the book about, you don't, you're not looking for closed canopy everywhere, are you? You're looking for a, for a mixture, I don't know. Well, absolutely not. I mean, I don't think a natural woodland is necessarily a closed canopy, entirely closed canopy because of the um, disturbance that was you know, naturally caused by um, the presence of these, of these many missing species that we now have missing from our, from our, from our landscapes. You know, so you mentioned boar, and uh, I would mention also things like aurochs, the wild aurochs, which yeah. is extinct now, essentially. So essentially, you have to kind of, um, if you want to reintroduce the equivalent, you have to look at things like longhorn cattle, or as they're starting to look at in Kent, they re reintroduce some bison, which is, you know, some people are going, wow, that's, that's pretty drastic. Why are you doing that? But they're doing a, a really interesting experiment there of looking 
at how bison cause disturbance and they're comparing and contrasting it with with longhorn cattle so they're going to find out what exactly what are the forms of disturbance that are caused um, in in uh, some of the ancient woodlands that they've reintroduced them to to there and i think one of the obvious impacts is is you do you create clearings you have you know dead wood being pushed down some you know smaller trees being um you know shunted over by by these huge bison and and and, and to some extent by longhorn cattle and you know you get other forms of disturbance that are very useful for potentially for the regeneration of, of trees by when you have boring woods, because whilst they're also, uh, you know, well known for shuffling around for fungi and also for acorns, um, they also are, you know, they're kind of basically doing soil preparation. You know, when we do have modern forestry, yeah, there's a soil preparation that goes on in terms of kind of sometimes ploughing up or, you know, scarifying the ground. That's what boar were doing. And you, stand, you tend to get interesting species that crop up in the areas of turf that um, boar will turn over. Um, and can also be sometimes replicated by wild pig or, you know, by certain species of pigs as well. So I think it's definitely about reintroducing missing species as well, which would start to give us a, a much more interesting ecosystem. Have, have you any take on that question about whether there would be more willow or wild fruit trees in the past, or is that carrying of seeds and things and stuff like that? That's not something I've no. read about. Um, I'd be interested in, yeah, if that's coming from, if there's a particular um, uh, sort of thing that's prompting that yeah i'd be interested in, in hearing more or, or reading more about um so absolute brilliant questions here thank you thank you all so much and i'm conscious of, of, of if it starts getting light outside guy i will let you know but we'll, 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 we'll maybe we'll do for maybe for five minutes more questions and then we will draw a line um uh i really wanted to ask this about the crossover of this topic with your book who owns england um the huge amount of land owned by a very few people how could we help restore our rainforest in light of this and i'd love to the, what is the question there is how did how did you stumble did you stumble from from one topic to the other or is there a connection and has the previous book helped your understanding of this or take on it at all yeah i mean i think i think def yeah there is there is a connection to me and you know at least you know, most sort of crude level it's the land <laughs> um but it's also i think about how um particularly uh, and this is obviously particularly acutely in scotland where the concentration of land ownership is so is so unequal and so extreme that I do think there is a connection between land ownership and and how we've used land and arguably abused land in the past uh, and, and right up to the present. And, you know, I, I, in the book, in Lost Rainforest book, I point to um, how many of the problems facing Scotland's temperate rainforest go, you know, stem back to the big sporting estates that got established uh, in the Victorian period and since. And, you know, that's everything from rampant deer numbers through to the introduction of rhododendron and um you know not not just as an ornamental plant in gardens but also as a you know game cover for pheasant shoots so i think there's a real really important um uh connection between talking about land ownership and talking about how we use land and how we restore nature to it in uh, going forward um and obviously something that i've i've been fascinated by and, and and keen that england does its utmost to learn from scotland is is community ownership and community buyouts um you know i have some hope now that um if we have a new government within the next two years at westminster that we might actually get that we might get the law changed here at, at long last in england uh because uh, certainly the labor party and, and perhaps other parties are starting to, to cotton onto this and uh, are talking about introducing community right to buy in england as scotland of course has had uh, for almost 20 years i think the land reform act is 20 years old I think it was it was so interesting in your book because you used the sentence Scotland, which is ahead of England and Wales on most things. And I thought, what an amazing <laughs> sentence to see written down because all we have seen of Scotland, all we see are the challenges we have in Scotland. And I think it's a, a, sometimes a nice reminder to see that other people look at the challenges we have with envy. I think there's a bit of an angle of it. Um, why does the Alliance for Scotland's Rainforest not include Galloway in their area of work? Do you know, do you know anything about that guy? Uh, so um, I, I, I wish to be very politic on this. Um, I, the Alliance does amazing work. I know that it it's, has to focus its, res, its limited resources on um, my understanding of, of is, is, is that they've focused on the West Coast, particularly because it's such a kind of core for um, surviving fragments of rainforest. And as we saw from those maps earlier, um, you know, the uh, <laughs> it's, it, 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 you know, it's, it, it's impossible to ignore the fact that there is an incredibly wet part <laughs> of the west coast of scotland where um and some amazing amazing temperate rainforest fragments survive um what i would say is that um certainly uh, i believe the alliance uh, you know knows this that there there is you know 
that the sort of the, the oceanic and hyperoceanic zones of climate do stretch beyond uh, that that uh, boundary. Um, but I think you know, and, and, and as I say, they they do clearly stretch into into Galloway. So I guess I guess what I would um, got, what I'd encourage you to do is, is, is support the work that the alliance does. Um, accept, you know, acknowledge that they are obviously stretched, already trying to do everything in the area that they've they've sort of defined as their core area of work. Um, but equally, um, you know, nothing is stopping uh, folks in in Galloway and Dumfries to set up um, also temperate rainforest restoration projects near where you are as well. So. Maybe tonight will be a step on that journey, possibly. Yes, I'd say. Um, do uh, uh, I'll just ask just a couple more questions, and then I will we'll let you rest. I promise. Uh, but there, is there anywhere in the world where there is abundant temperate rainforest? Where where would your mind go to as uh, as having not quite such a perilous state as we have here? Well, I I was going to say the Pacific Northwest of um, you know Canada and 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 some parts of the US, but um, I've never been there. Uh, I'm hope, I'm hoping to actually go later this year. Um, and I've been talking to someone who has been sending me some information about uh, about the, the, the state of them, and, and you know it's, it does make for rather depressing reading about how much even of uh, even of, um, uh, of of that area of temperate rainforest has been felled, um, again much of it logged over the over the last century or two. Uh, so you know I'm going to be if I do end up going, I'm going to be really interested to talk to local activists and talk to. Um, indigenous peoples who uh, first nation peoples in Canada who obviously have um you know right, rightly claim claim uh, much of this land as their own uh, and um you know very interested in hearing about actually what has changed there um but uh, that said it is clearly the case that Pacific Northwest of uh, of, of of Canada and America clearly uh, North America clearly do have um the, some of the largest stretches of temperate rainforest remaining in the world um, other places are places like Argentina, Chile, um, New Zealand, Tasmania, uh, but a lot of them have been affected. There was a big um, battle, uh, lots of battles, of course, to, to try and stop Tasmania from being logged for uh, pulp and paper over the years. And in fact, one of the first um, one of the first rainforests that came to sort of Western attention in, in sort of environmentalist terms um, was uh, was one of the temperate rainforests of Tasmania in, in the in the 1980s when there was a dam that was going to be built. And that would have flooded a huge area of rainforest there. Cool. Um, there are just, ex, just a couple more questions, I promise. Guys. There's a couple of extra excellence here. It's very interesting seeing your map of Dumfries and Galloway of uh, rainforest sites because the obviously folk, for, with the, if you look at the topography of the place, the focus tends to be on the Galloway Hills, which is the sort of Galloway interior, really, the inaccessible uh, interior of the wild Galloway Hills. Um, and I've got a question here from Malcolm, who works for Galloway and Southern Ayrshire UNESCO Biosphere, which is based on the hills and the seven river catchments that come from it, plugged into the global network of biospheres. Um, as you use bryophytes and lichens to help map the temperate rainforest, is there a possibility of using citizen science to help improve our understanding of Galloway's rainforest? Uh, I don't know if there's, you know, that's come across your desk so far, Guy. Absolutely. And I guess, um, you know, this is something that plant life clearly do a lot of work with, uh, with you know, getting anybody involved in that sort of that sort of citizen science. I know uh, Woodland Trust have also done similar sort of um, work. I, I would certainly encourage everyone to get involved with things like that and to, you know, to start using, um, you know, publicly available data sources like the MBN Atlas that I mentioned earlier. That's just all online. Um, and to go out into you know your local woodlands and look for some of these species um, you know it it's absolutely the case that not everything has been recorded it couldn't possibly be um and you know you often get um some areas that get uh very very heavily recorded and so it looks like they've got loads and loads of amazing species where they are but it's actually just the sheer presence of the you know the botanical recorders um and other areas look completely bereft but it might be because no one has gone there to look yet so yeah, um, I think there's somebody suggesting iNaturalist and other apps and so on that you, people can use and, and to, to be able to log some of these uh, species. Definitely, um, definitely get involved in that. I'm, I'm going to try and answer a couple of questions at one time here about um, inner city rainforests. So we've got cities, we've got people that don't have sheep, or and obviously there's an angle here. Is is there a question of bringing rainforest to where there are where to urban and more urban environments? Does that make it more accessible? Does that help the case of of engaging people with rainforests, I suppose, probably is there anything that's, have you, ever, have you ever seen it? Are people the problem or could they be where people are? I suppose it's probably a question. Um, 
that's an interesting, an interesting set of questions. I'm not sure. I don't know of any um, urban rainforests. I mean, I guess there could be. I mean, uh, I mean, just sort of reaching, <laughs> reaching for where I near where I live. It's, it's, it's a good, it's a good question. Probably to challenge yeah. your thinking of where what a rainforest yeah. is. Probably no, is. absolutely. I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, clearly, um, you know, if a if a an urban area is in the rainforest zone, there's no reason why there couldn't yeah. be there but for the you know sheer amounts of concrete and bricks and so on that stand in the way so you know and I'm, I'm certainly uh certainly would think I certainly think that we need to rewild our cities uh, as as well as our sort of more remote parts of the landscape um I guess it's just about what um you know what level of uh of actual of nature can be physically uh, restored in, in certain places so you know, and, and, it's all very well to sort of reintroduce beavers and lynx to to certain parts of the world, but um, you know they they may not be quite so much at home. You know, stalking stalking the streets of uh, of a city. So, I, I think you mentioned in the book about we must not love our rainforest to death, and I thought that was quite an interesting phrase because it, it it's about it's about well, is, there, is there a risk? I suppose with what you're doing uh, in engaging people with rainforest, people start going out and wandering out. Well, leaving sandwich wrappers through the middle of it all and, and well, well absolutely sure and, and so, so that leads on yes that leads nicely onto the sort of question of access and so on well i mean you know there is, there is of course the risk of of honeypot sites developing it's something we've seen with wisman's wood on dartmoor that um particularly during uh, lockdowns there was quite a lot of visitors to it and it has seen increasing visitor pressure over the years um i guess you know i uh, someone who also believes really strongly in our right to roam and think we should have far more of it in England as as you guys do in Scotland um that I don't think it to me it's so much about the legal rights of access as about the uh, uh you know as in I don't think that's a problem it shouldn't be a problem at all it should be actually about um the process of of reconnecting and reacquainting ourselves with being out in nature and that you know things like the Scottish Outdoor Access Code and to a lesser extent the Countryside Code in in England, you know, they, these are these are you know people adhere to them. You're not going to have a problem, really. Um, uh, you know, you do get problems with things like dogs off leads. Uh, I do think that's an additional problem of things like disturbance of ground nesting birds, no question. Um, but you know, the sheer presence of people at low densities in in the rainforest is not in itself going to cause huge problems. What I've never seen in a temperate rainforest is a visitor eating one of the saplings. But I have seen plenty of sheep doing that. So I, I think we need to sometimes get in perspective the kind of slightly new jerk anti-people kind of uh, vibe that sometimes I, I hear um, about kind of deterring people getting into the countryside. It's, it's actually come back to the same thing all the time. It's don't let the people, this minority spoil it for the majority. It's always the challenge of these things. Of course, really, absolutely. You know. yeah. the, um, Evie's put an excellent couple of questions here. I wish I could ask you a question about the royal family, Evie, but I know that that's basically a whole chapter in Guy's book is about the Duchy of Cornwall, and we won't go into that. Yeah, yeah, but uh, do we uh, have to deer fence these potential rainforests, or do you advocate killing the deer? I don't know. Let's address that topic head on. Guy, do you have any thoughts? Or it's just it's the absence of deer is your focus rather than the method. Uh, yes, I, I mean, I think we have to be honest about this, I, you know, unless we are going to reintroduce um, apex predators again at significant densities, we are going to have to cull deer at a much, much greater level than is currently being done. I don't think there is all the fencing in the world that would keep deer out of every temperate rainforest and every potential temperate rainforest and other, and other important ancient woodland. Um, I absolutely think we should be reintroducing apex predators. I think we should be having lynx and, and at some point wolves. Uh, that has to be done, obviously, with local national consent, uh, obviously. Um, but, uh, you know, I do think many, many other nations on Earth, uh, you know, coexist with, with these creatures. Um, you know, Holland, there are wolves in Holland, you know, even more densely populated than, than England. And... Yeah, I think we need to, um, you know, we need to grapple with that. But I do think, I do think sort of just saying, oh, we can just reintroduce apex predators and saying we shouldn't have culling would be the wrong approach. I think we do actually have to have and, 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 and you know, sort of, <laughs> excuse the pun, bite the bullet on this one and, and, and accept that we have to have more culling in the meantime. The, um, the uh, uh, so final question here, I can't not ask this, is about the impact of the climate crisis. And I wonder whether, have you had any 
thoughts and the work that you've done so far about how how this would affect temperate rainforests or particularly temperate rainforest zones, I suppose, probably. Or, yeah. Yes, I mean, it's not something we sort of actually mapped and modelled yet. Um, certainly it could be done to look at, you know, the likely warming in the pipeline, you know, the 1.5 to 2 degrees that is almost certainly in the pipeline now. Um, uh, and, and to look at how that it affects the temperate rainforest zone. Now, clearly, um, you know, a lot of the forecasts are, a lot of the, a lot of the um, projections are for wetter winters as well as hotter, drier summers. Um, what we also do need clearly is, is that kind of equability, you know, the equable climate, you know, the fact that it's not just sort of oscillating between extremes, uh, that, you know, that those are the sort of conditions that, that allow temperate rainforests to thrive. So I am worried, of course, uh, you know, as everyone should be absolutely petrified and terrified and, uh, and, and motivated by the threat of the climate crisis. Um, what I would suggest is, is, is rather than sort of, um, you know, despair about it is that we do things that make nature more resilient to these impacts. So, you know, to me, it's fairly foolish to leave our, our, our rainforests as tiny fragments that are isolated from one another. By reconnecting them, by making them larger, we're giving them a greater chance of being, you know, buffering against some of these impacts and giving the species that exist in them, uh, the kind of corridors down which they can move if 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 you know temperatures do rise to to that extent cool well that I mean that's thank you thank you so thank you so much guy I, mean, I, I can't not end with this question of um do midges have a place in a temperate rainforest <laughs> no <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the well, hopefully they will continue to have one have I, 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 the, the vital part of the food chain <laughs> the um Brilliant. I mean, I'm, I'm very conscious we said the event would finish by nine o'clock. Thank you all so much, everybody, for your excellent questions. Uh, and thanks, massive thanks, obviously, to Guy for taking part. If you haven't had a chance to read his book yet, I cannot recommend it enough. Um, and really, everything we're doing from uh, anything we can do to, to support your efforts to identify and better understand the rainforests, in, particularly here in Galloway, but further afield is very much appreciated. Lots of hands being clapped to the bottom. Um, I can just wrap up now by saying uh, this was an event part of the fantastic forest festival and so you're going to ask me who are the what are the next events taking place and this saturday we have the spruce plucking world championship inaugural events taking place this saturday afternoon and there is a public event as part of that so two o'clock uh, well on the Saturday afternoon. I'll send the email out tomorrow with the link in it, but you could book your place to join us for spruce plucking. What is spruce plucking, you may, may ask? Well, uh, you, you could find out this Saturday. And then next Friday, we're going to have an event called Imagining Our Future Woodlands, where we've actually been able to bring together a whole selection of different sectors, farming, forestry, uh, access, outdoor access, uh, tourism, recreation, fisheries, all the sectors coming together to say, what, what could we imagine our future woodlands in Galloway is? How could we build on what we have at the moment? What would be the best possible outcome in the future? And so it's trying to build on the consensus that's there at the moment, build on the series of events that we've had, and actually have a bit of balance from every different sector representing it. So um, that's in Delray Town Hall next Friday. Um, and I think that is that leaves everything. Let's leave me to say massive thanks again to Guy. Also, thanks behind the scenes to the Communities for Diverse Forestry group who helped work with Guy and get the event set up. Um, and if you're not following them already, I'll put the details in the email tomorrow. And um, do keep an eye on Galloway Lens channels for, for future events. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Mm -hmm.